Energy. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, who of you knows what Socrates is roughly? So just that we can just, uh, oh, okay, good. Uh, good. Then we can do a quick intro, I guess, and spend a bit more time on, on the later slides of the, the presentation. Okay. Um, this used to work. So Socrates started as my research project basically at TU Berlin, but by now we're happy to develop it as part of an Ethereum Foundation team. It's uh, three people at the moment, but we're looking to grow, so in the end, feel free to, to get in touch. Um, let's start with introduction and vision before we dive into more. So the, the plan of today's talk is basically three things. First, we provide a bit of an introduction background for those that are not that familiar with the tooling, but we'll keep it short. Then we'll give you a bit of an update on what's been happening in the last year. So basically a dev update, which new features we have, where we were going, and then we look at some use cases. So we report back from actual applications, apps that in, uh, improved on their privacy properties by leveraging Socrates-based CK snarks. And as a last step, we'll give you a bit of an outlook of what we think where we should be going in the next year. So Socrates is basically two things. It's a high-level language for programming CK snarks, in, and it's a bunch of tooling around all of that. So with Socrates in that language, you can program in an imperative style, as most programmers are used to, um, some program. And then it provides you tooling, so you can compile that program into an abstraction that uh, is provable through CK snarks. And then you can use the Socrates tooling to um, compile your program, execute your program, and generate the CK snark proof that shows you that this execution happened correctly. And it also generates you smart contracts, solidity contracts, that you can deploy to the blockchain so you can easily verify CK snarks on Ethereum without having to bother with writing solidity verifiers for the specific CK snark mechanism uh, you choose in the end. So what are the main goals behind Socrates? It's basically two things, and the first is enhancing privacy. With Ethereum, we have this platform that's very general. We can do general purpose computations. It's quite powerful. But for real applications to take off, we require a bit more privacy, I think, because there is awareness that all the data put on the blockchain can be mined and used by anyone. And that's a showstopper for some applications. And we'll see that later when we look at the use cases. For Bitcoin, we've seen kind of an improvement through Zcash that managed to do fully anonymous payment schemes on top of CK snarks. And of course, you cannot simply do a scheme for Ethereum because Ethereum is too generic for that. So our approach is to provide easy to use and convenient tooling that you can, for your specific application in the Ethereum context, leverage CK snarks conveniently to improve your privacy properties. And the second thing is scalability. Um, so we're in the world on the left right now where we redundantly process all transactions that are submitted to the blockchain on every node. And we would like in the future, and we already do it in some cases, move to the world on the right where we do not execute complex things on the blockchain, but rather execute complex things off the blockchains while maintaining privacy, because we do not need to expose all the information we use in this object processing, then send the result of that computation, plus a proof that it tests its correctness back to the blockchain, and only check that. And as long as the verification step on-chain is cheaper than the native execution on-chain, we will be able to scale better, because in one block we can fit more computational complexity that way. So that's the two main drivers behind why this is meaningful and why you should have a look. The language itself that we use is, or built, is an imperative um, domain specific language, which means it is tailor-made to efficiently compile into abstractions CK snarks to use. Sure, you could use a generic programming language like C or Rust, and there's also compilers for that. But many of the data types and the syntactic constructs they offer, they are not efficiently translatable into the CK-SNARK provable abstractions. So that's why we kind of have this DSL 
to be sure that what you write is kind of efficient at least. It's Python inspired syntax, but we borrow like the best pieces from whatever language, kind of, but it's mostly uh, similar to Python. And the, the thing that makes CK Snark programming hard, or one of the things that makes it hard, one of the scary parts of Snark programming, is this non determinism, which means you call to an outside component, you get some results and validate that as part of your Snark, and as you maybe feel this is quite complex and it's something people do not want to take care of. So Socrates hides away all this snark specific programming complexity and hides non-determinism without any loss of um, expressivity or power in what you can do with it. That's also kind of contribution here. If you want to check it out, thanks to the guys in the back and good work by Tebo, there is now Remix integration of the tooling. So it's live on Remix, not the very latest version, but you can go play around with it to get a feeling and you can go through all the steps, writing the program, compiling, executing, and proving. Um, and also there is going to be a workshop tomorrow from Remix and they'll go into more detail about that. And now I'll hand over to Tivo for a bit of a dev update what happened last year. Right. Um, so the first thing that we focused on over the past months is adding more expressivity to the Zorchitz types. For, for those of you who actually used Zorchitz before, uh, we have very basic types that were basically field elements, which you can think of as integers, and we had booleans but we didn't really have complex types, so it, it made it quite verbose to write programs. So what we added is um, arrays of multiple dimensions with helpers to create them with a given value, as well as the spread operator that you might know from uh, JavaScript and other languages, as well as slicing to get to part of an array, so all at the syntactic level. Um, in the same sort of spirit, we added uh, structures, uh, which enable you to create composite types to represent, for example, a point on an empty curve uh, that can be really useful in the context of snarks if you're trying to verify a signature inside of a snark. Um, and, and other things. Here we also have constructors and mutation and access as you would expect uh, as you have in, in, in many other languages. So that's live now on the latest version of Synthesis that we released uh, very recently. Um, this, these new types and more complex types bring us even closer to a higher level uh, language and, and that's what Zoptis is. And it enables you, developers, to have code that's even clearer and, and cleaner. However, we don't want to sacrifice um, performance in terms of the size of the circuit that gets generated. So in, in Zoptis you can write the clearest code, code and then Zoptis will apply a number of simple yet powerful optimization steps to your program uh, in order to reduce the size of the, the program as much as possible. So these uh, optimizations uh, are the ones you would find in many programming languages. Among them, uh, constant propagation, which basically computes as much as possible of your program at compile time. If you have constants in your program, for example, all of this is going to be already pre-computed for you. Um, um, removing all of the linear constraints, so starts are based on quadratic constraints, so all the linear constraints are uh, substituted so that you only have the quadratic constraints, and uh, a few other optimizations that we have worked on. And we, we have quite good results in that. Um, on a different end of uh, the com compiler pipeline, we um, changed from a handwritten parser that we were using in the first version of Zocritus to a parser generator. Uh, so this is quite internal, uh, but basically uh, the idea is that we used to have a parser that we, written by, that we wrote by hand to parse from source code to the AST, and now we have a formal, formal uh, specification of our grammar that generates a parser automatically, um, which actually gave us better performance in some cases, uh, which would signal that our handwritten parser was actually not that efficient. And also, interestingly, it made it much, much simpler for us to implement the new types that I just described, the structures and, and, and arrays. So we would totally encourage anyone working on programming languages uh, in the early steps of the process to use parser generators 
especially we're using a, fr a framework called uh, PEST and Rust, and we've been pretty, pretty happy with it. Um, then over the course of the past year, when we went from having simple examples to get people started on Snarks to uh, having more complex applications, we realized that there's a lot of building blocks that people end up needing over and over again. And that includes mostly hash functions. So the first thing that people want to do is how do I, how do I compute a hash inside of a Snark? As well as um, embedded curves so that you can have elliptic curve cryptography inside of the Snark which is very powerful, especially for scalability schemes. So what we did first was to use existing, existing other libraries to um, import those building blocks. But we, we changed our approach and ended up um, rewriting all of those building blocks into Optus itself to see how it would perform, and also to use our own, uh, our own project. So the result of that is that now uh, Zopitis ships with a standard library, uh, which you can import directly from your source code and use uh, directly. That has uh, those utilities, so some cryptography, some utilities to do packing and unpacking, if you want to uh, go from bits to, uh, to the number, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, we also worked on a library called PyCrypto, and basically the intuition there is that in the standard library, for example, uh, I mentioned that we have elliptic curve cryptography. So with elliptic curve cryptography, you want to be able to uh, work with signatures, for example. However, inside of the SNARK, you're always only going to verify the signature. You're not going to generate the signatures because generating a signature, you could that before uh, hitting the, the SNARK itself. So this PyCrypto is our current approach to this missing component of everything that you can basically do before you hit the snark. And in this case, uh, there is the example of how you would uh, sign a message with EDSA. And, and then based on, on, on this piece of uh, Python code, you can take the output of that and then feed that into the snark, and the snark would verify that the signature you, you created is actually valid. Um, Finally, uh, we worked on integrating with more backends. So we used to integrate with only LiveSnark, which is uh, a C++ implementation of, uh, of uh, pre-processing snarks. Um, we added support for Bellman, which is a Rust-based uh, prover that's now being used by uh, Zcash. As well as we've been um, designing and also developing integration with uh, something called ZK Interface. So maybe some of you have heard of it. It comes from the ZK Proof um, initiative, which is basically a standard for backends of um, zero knowledge proof systems. And basically, what this means is that using Zocrates, uh, it will soon be possible to integrate with all the new schemes that came up recently. So maybe some of you saw Plong and Supersonics and, and all those new schemes that pop up. And we think it would be really, really valuable if you could just write your program in Zopities and then would completely would interoperate with any of those backends because they all rely on the same abstraction. Um, so now we're going to go through a few applications that people have been building with Zopities. Uh, and I, I hand over to Jake for that. Okay, now we heard a bit more on the background and internal changes. Now we want to look at what actually has been done or is currently being done with the tooling. We provide. So, first project is EY Nightfall. And uh, EY Nightfall is a project for Ernst Young or EY. And it's basically a privacy preserving implementation of ERC20, ERC 721 token standards on Ethereum so that you can have these tokens in and use them with complete privacy on Ethereum. So we will today not go into much detail about that because on main stage tomorrow there's going to be a talk about the project by the UI folks themselves. And uh, what's interesting to note though is that it was not like us going to them and telling them please use it and we'll help you out, but they picked it up independently and actually built it. And we didn't really know that they did it unless they released, right? So that was for us cool to see as kind of a validation that the tooling is actually useful for people and projects are being built with it. Um, something else is a joint project um, we did with uh, Centrifuge. So 
Centrifuge is a service for financial documents and it basically means you have financial documents that two people or a bunch of people agree on off-chain. It's an off-chain protocol. But these documents, financial documents, for example, invoices, they get anchored on the blockchain. And then it provides a single reference point everybody can point to, right? So that's the, the centrifuge model. But having claims, that means if there's an unpaid invoice and I have the right to retrieve that payment, that's actually value. And it would be nice to unlock that on the blockchain, right? To bring that to Ethereum as kind of a token to tokenize it. So for that, Centrifuge wants to mint NFTs that kind of um, tokenize the claim to retrieve a payment by a party in the future. And of course, what's important is the credit rating of that counterparty because it kind of gives you an estimate of your expected value that you will be able to retrieve after you purchase that token. Okay, so they built this, but the problem is to mint that NFT in the correct way to make sure you need to expose the value of the invoice which can be an issue sometimes and you also need to expose the buyer's identity or the, the counterparty's identity so you will know whether he has good credit rating or not and otherwise you're not going to buy this token right so nice idea but it's not really going to work out because this information is quite sensitive so with the Socrates based approach, we were able to replace these checks by using CK snarks. And now the only information that's exposed when minting NFTs is the token amount, and it's guaranteed to be smaller than the invoice amount that allows you to also split up an invoice into several NFTs, and the counterparty's credit rating. So you only learn the key fact that your counterparty, that you're buying uh, a claim for basically, is credit worthy, but you do not learn who exactly it is, and that's that's key in the protocol. How it works is that we basically um, replace a traditional NFT registry that does these checks on the blockchain through a Socrates program, and that Socrates program does all these checks as part of a CK snark. And after it did that, you generate you generate the CK snark proof. Submit it to an on-chain token registry, and that on-chain token registry then simply checks is the proof correct or is the proof not correct. And if successful, the token is minted. And only that information I mentioned before and some root hashes to make sure the right data was used are exposed in the process. So that's quite nice. The implementation, the core part of the code, I mean, I mean there's some utility functions and stuff, is 80 lines of Socrates core DSL code, and you can find it here on GitHub, and the verification cost was 900k gas for the um, prototypical implementation that was done, which was not highly optimized. I mean, there could have been, for example, we could have used Peterson commitments instead of SHA um, and, and slide details that would bring down the, um, the cost of proving, for example. And the verification cost will probably be around about 300k, which is not too bad after the Istanbul half fork. And proving time in that unoptimized um, version was two and a half minutes, so totally practical. And on a consumer laptop, not a super heavy duty cloud machine, right? Okay. Um, I'm also going to quickly go through another project that I personally work on as part of a project at uh, TU Berlin, we use Socrates as well. And the problem is that currently the energy system, at least in Germany and in most other countries, kind of works like this. Households are in a network and there's an electric utility, right? And some households, they produce more energy than they consume because they have sol the solar panels on their roofs, for example, and others consume more um, these areas. Okay, let's not do that. Uh, and, and the other households, they consume more than they produce. But the problem is, everything goes through that electric utility. And of course, they make a profit from it, right? They make a margin. They give you a small, uh, they give you little money for the energy they buy, and they resell it at a higher price. And then there's tax effects and other effects why it could be beneficial to not do it that way. So what we propose, how you would do it, we try to do as much internally in the network. But we do not do it on a marketplace where you bid and ask, which is super expensive and has many problems. But we rather say, 
we look back in time after everybody produced or consumed the energy and then we basically make a matching and match the produced energy by households with the consumed energy by household and kind of minimize the, the amount of energy that ever goes through that electric utility. And that takes away their, their profit and makes it more profitable for households to have solar plan, uh, panels installed because the big issue that in many cases is not profitable is kind of bad for moving on to renewable energies. One minute. Um, One minute. Okay. So that's the idea, and the core problem is we do not trust the utility with doing this allocation algorithm, this matching, right? So we want this to be on a blockchain because then it's untrusted. But that means households publish their energy consumption data, and the blockchain then computes the matching. But publishing that data is really bad, right? Because then everybody can see how much energy is uh, used by everybody or uh, produced by anybody. This is highly sensitive data, so we cannot do that. That's why we introduced a Socrates-based CK snark that does that matching algorithm, and the blockchain only verifies that the matching has been computed um, in line with some specific um, requirements. It's it's fair and the correct, the same amount. Like yeah, the amounts work out. Inputs outputs are equal. All that kind of stuff. Okay. Sneak peek in the future in one minute. Um, so we've been moving very fast, we've been breaking things, we've been changing specs, implementation has been progressing rapidly, and now I think we need to slow that down a little bit. We need to come to a version that is stable so users can actually rely on some version, start building with it without us breaking it again and again through disruptive changes. And it would also allow us to do further optimizations to the code base and crucially for people who want to use it in production, get some audit, get potentially some formal verification on the optimization steps we do and stuff like that. So that's our plan for the next year, to slow down a bit with the breaking changes and to move to a more stable release, hopefully. If you're interested in the Rust development, programming languages, state-of-the-art cryptography, we're looking to grow the team, so please get in touch, and thank you very much for your attention and for coming.